Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Australia's energy future, shaping a climate changing world. Now, my name is Justine Jarvanen. Do feel free to call me JJ. I'm CEO of the UNSW Energy Institute. I'd like to acknowledge the Bedigal people of the Eora Nation that are traditional custodians of the land that I'm on. And I'd also like to pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. We've got a fabulous panel here today, and I'll introduce them before outlining our program. So joining us today is Dave Sharma. He's MP for Wentworth in Sydney. Dave has qualifications in law and has significant international diplomatic experience, having been posted uh, at the Australian High Commission in Papua New Guinea and in the Australian Embassy in Washington. He's also been advisor to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Assistant Secretary in the International Div Division for the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet, and Assistant Secretary for the Africa Branch of DFAT. And he served as Australia's Ambassador for Israel from 2013 to 2017. And I've been looking forward to Dave's experience providing a fascinating perspective to our conversation today. Also joining us is Grant King, who was appointed as the Chair of the Climate Change Authority earlier this year. Grant is also Chairman of HSBC Australia. Grant has a number of other roles in the ESG space. He chairs the Green Collar Board, the CWP Renewables Board, and is Director of the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. He previously chaired the Australian Government's Expert Panel on Low-Cost Carbon Abatement Opportunities, and is currently a member of the Ministerial Advisory Council for the Te Top Technology Investment Roadmap. Grant was President of the Business Council of Australia from 2016 to 2019, and before that he held a range of um, roles in a variety of energy companies and associations, including being Managing Director of Origin Energy, where I first met him about 20 years ago. And Grant is also the Chair of the Industry Advisory Board for the UNSW Energy Institute. In our program today, uh, Dave Sharma is going to give an address for 15 minutes, and then the three of us are going to have a conversation based on questions submitted by the audience ahead of the event, and responding to live questions coming through the chat function of the webinar. So if you didn't already ask questions when you are registered, please do feel free to submit your questions during the webinar and we'll get to as many of them as we can. And we'll be finishing up at 1 p.m. So responding to climate change is such a huge and multifaceted challenge and opportunity. And there are lots of levers of change, including policy, politics and diplomacy, economics and international finance, corporate strategy and investment, laws and regulations, media and public opinion, research, education, technology, and personal consumer choices and action. In the lead up to COP26 in November, some of these levers are becoming very prominent. What policies will Australia take to COP26? How will that be influenced by our local politics and media? And what will that mean for our diplomatic efforts? To explore that and more, I'm delighted to now invite Dave Sharma to give his address. Thank you, Dave. Thanks so much, Justine, and thank you to UNSW and the Energy Institute, which I've visited a number of times for hosting me virtually today. And um, let me also acknowledge uh, Grant King, who's on the call and on the panel as well, and um, the quite remarkable amount of work he's done in helping shape public policy in this area over, over several decades now. Um, look, when I think about this, I, I think about this in terms of some of the other transformations the world has gone through. And if you if if you're a a baby boomer if you're a baby boomer i'm a little it's a little bit before my time but not much um, and you came of age in the united states in the 1960s if you looked around and saw the main engines of the u.s economy um, you'd see the five largest u.s companies by market capitalization at the time and those were general motors standard oil kodak at&t and ibm these were the big bear lots of the time now one of these companies barely exists in a recognizable form kodak um, the main successor to what was then Standard Oil, ExxonMobil, dropped out of the Dow Jones Industrial Average last year, having been the largest US company by market cap as recently as 2013. Um, nowadays, the biggest automaker by market capitalization is Tesla, which makes electric vehicles. It's worth roughly 10 times General Motors. And if you look today at what are the top five US companies by market capitalization, You've got Apple, you've got Microsoft, you've got Alphabet or, or Google, as we know it. You've got Amazon and Facebook. Now, these are the drivers of jobs, wealth and prosperity today. And there's a, more than a good chance that you've used these products, the products of at least one of these companies today. You might well be using it right now. And in many respects, they're indispensable to the modern economy and to modern lives as well. Now, when I think about this, this has been a pretty profound restructuring of industry and the economy in the last 50 years. And 
how is this relevant to Australia's energy future and the global energy future? Well, I think when it comes to energy, we're at the start of an equally profound transformation. It's a transformation that has immense potential upside for Australia if we get it right, but it does also entail risks. And if we end up on the wrong side of some of these historical forces, then it will jeopardise our future prosperity and our future living standards. Now, just last month, we had the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, release the first part of its sixth assessment report, known as IR6. And it is a very stark and a sobering read, and it should be a wake-up call for all of us. As the report makes clear, and with a level of certainty and confidence not seen in its last report, climate change is already underway. It's already happening. The planet is already warming. It's about uh, already about 1.1 degrees Celsius warmer than it was in 1850. Extreme weather events are already becoming more common, and I think we've all seen the evidence of this all around us in this past year. Um, and the report makes clear and unequivocal that it's human activity and growing concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, especially carbon dioxide, also methane, that are the cause of this and that human influence is warming the climate at a rate that's unprecedented in at least the last 2,000 years, that which is as far back as we can have a sense of some of this. The last time the world had a concentration of CO2 at this level, the world was three degrees warmer, Greenland was, was green. Um, and as the report makes clear as well, rapid and large scale emissions reductions are needed and they're needed from right now. If the world can substantially reduce emissions in the 2020s in this decade and get to net zero carbon emissions by 2050, temperature rises, can still be limited, but the clock is ticking and the sense of urgency is growing. And this is very much going to be the backdrop to the next Glasgow meeting, the next conference of the parties of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change or the UNFCCC. Now, having talked about how what a sobering um, set of uh, warnings the IPCC report contains, I would also say that I'm, I'm fundamentally an optimist when it comes to uh, us as a species, humanity as a species, not a doomsayer. Since at least the Enlightenment, we've continuously proven wrong the pessimists, and we've shown ourselves both sufficiently innovative and sufficiently wise to avert catastrophe and to change course when needed. The world's answer to Thomas Malthus's gloomy prediction of overpopulation and mass famine was the agricultural revolution. The world's answer to the threat of mutual nuclear annihilation was the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty established de-escalation channels in US-Soviet detente. The world's answer to the threatened destruction of the ozone layer, which was a relatively recent phenomenon, was to agree the Montreal Protocol and to phase out ozone depleting substances. And the world's answer to the modern day plague, the COVID-19 pandemic, has been to develop and scale vaccines in an absolutely record time including vaccines that are using mRNA technology for the very first time. So even if at times as a species we've looked over the precipice and given ourselves a bit of a scare, we've always navigated our way back from the brink. So I have faith in our ability, humanity's ability to overcome this challenge of climate change, just as we've overcome many before. But this does not mean we can afford to be complacent, but it does and should be an antidote to some of the counsels of despair, which too often characterise this discussion. Now, in my mind, one of the positives, if you like, from the IPCC report is that it has killed climate denialism. The IPCC report has laid to rest those claims that the link between CO2 concentrations and global warming was not clear or who people who claim that natural climatic variability was the main driver. But I think it is now giving rise to what I'd call climate delays. And these are the people, particularly in Australia, that tell you the problem is too big for Australia alone, that we can't move the needle, that we shouldn't bother at all, that our economy or our lifestyle are too dependent on fossil fuels to chart another path. These are fatalists, and I also take objection to this attitude. Australia has never been a country to leave our fate in the hands of others or to shirk from global challenges. And our military record alone attests to this. From World War I right through to Afghanistan, we've prided ourselves on making an outsized contribution to address a global challenge. We quite willingly play our part, even if we're realistic enough to recognise that our own role may not be decisive. Um, we're not fatalists. We recognise our own agency and we don't deny our own ability to make a contribution. Instead, we act. And... To take a contemporary example, we just demonstrated this just last week in our bold and 
far-sighted decision to go down the pathway of acquiring nuclear-powered submarines. And it's my view that we need a similar boldness of vision and sense of national agency when it comes to our energy transformation. Now, too often, I think those who seek to argue for a more ambitious climate policy in Australia find that they need to denigrate or dismiss what we've achieved so far. Now, this is not only wrong analytically, but it is divisive politically, and it hampers our ability to create an enduring approach. If you're not prepared to acknowledge the progress that's been made to date and build on that, then you're not in the business of finding solutions. You're in the business of mindless partisanship. So let's examine our record here. Our emissions today in Australia are 20% lower than in 2005. They're at their lowest level since records began in 1990. This does compare well with other countries. Across the OECD, the average reduction in emissions across the same period is around 9%. If you look at countries like Canada and New Zealand, which are often held up as paragons of climate virtue, over this same period, their emissions have barely reduced at all. We are, as Australia, on track to meet and exceed our Paris emissions reduction targets. And without the use of overachieving on our Kyoto targets, without the use of Kyoto credits, we're installing renewable energy generation capacity at a record rate, 10 times faster than the global average. In 2020, just last year, we installed a record seven gigawatts of renewable energy generating capacity in Australia, which was a record versus 2019, which was itself a record of 2018. We've now got the highest solar capacity per person of any country in the world. And we're investing in key energy infrastructure that will allow more renewables to come into the grid. Big projects like Snowy Hydro 2.0, a pumped hydro storage scheme, the Marinus Link, which will connect us up to Tasmania and its immense hydro potential and, and reserves there. Um, so I think when we look at this, we have to recognise that considerable progress has been made today, but we must also, and I do recognise that we're still in the foothills and that there is still a mountain yet to climb here. And just as in any other area of policy, energy and climate policy cannot be set and forget. And I turn back here to our decision on the submarines last week. Just last week, we walked away from uh, what was going to be the most expensive defence acquisition project in the modern era in Australia to acquire 12 diesel powered attack class submarines. Now, to walk away from this decision was not an easy thing to do. There was already a lot spent in going down this path. There were some costs, financial, diplomatic and others in changing course. So why did we do it? Well, we did it because our fundamental circumstances have changed since 2016. And the decision we made in 2016 about acquiring the nuclear diesel, sorry, the attack class diesel powered submarines was no longer um, relevant or no longer made sense in 2021. Well, when I look at our energy and climate policy, I see three fundamental circumstances that have changed since we first set our Paris targets back in 2015. Firstly, the IPCC report. Secondly, what the Soviets would have called the correlation of world forces. Um, and thirdly, the comparative advantage and opportunities for Australia in a low carbon world economy, which were not as apparent um, six years ago. And let me go into each of these in turn. Firstly, the IPCC reports make clear that the climate is already warming at an alarming rate. Extreme weather events are already becoming more common and more expensive and the world's transition towards net zero needs to be happening at a faster rate. Secondly, the correlation of world forces. Well. The world's largest emitter, China, has now recognised its responsibility to act and, act and committed to reaching net zero emissions by 2060. There are good reasons to be sceptical of some of their claims given the, um, some of their other actions in the interim, but for the first time they've recognised their responsibility to play a role, and that's critical as they're the largest emitter. The United States, which is the world's second largest emitter, has returned to the Paris Agreement with New Zealand and is committed now to net zero emissions by 2050. Much of the developed world and every Australian state and territory has now committed to net zero by 2050, and many nations, including our main peers in what's called the umbrella group of nations, have increased their 2030 targets. We've seen global capital markets, pension funds, insurers, investors, all signed up to net zero by 2050. And increasingly, they're putting a climate risk prism on investments and on capital allocation decisions. And for a country like Australia, with our 
level of integration with and dependence on global capital markets. This means that our commitment to reduce emissions and reach net zero is now inextricably tied to our own economic future. Uh, and thirdly and finally, and most importantly, I think are the immense opportunities that are becoming clearer for Australia, including for Australia's regions in the global energy transformation that's underway. In Australia, we're endowed with the lithium and the rare earth metals necessary to build new energy networks, battery storage, and a more electrified and connected world. Green hydrogen has the potential to be the liquid fuel of the future in Australia with our large renewable endowment of both solar and wind is uniquely positioned to provide this. And liquid hydrogen will allow us to almost ship sunshine, ship sunshine as Alan Finkel, the former chief scientist says. We're also likely moving to a world where industry locates near the source of energy rather than the fossil fuel world that saw energy travel to industry. And for a country like Australia, this means more opportunities to process more of our raw materials onshore from bauxite to iron ore and to create and manufacture products like low emission steel and low emission aluminium. This could see the reindustrialization of Australia and key ports and regions within Australia as well. And meanwhile, carbon sequestration in our soils or soil carbon can improve agricultural productivity and drought resilience as it's been shown, but it can also deliver a significant and growing revenue stream for some of our farmers. Early this year, a cattle grazing property in New England through better livestock and grazing management was able to lift its soil carbon and sell half a million dollars worth of soil credits, carbon credits to Microsoft. Low emissions technologies could position Australia for over $30 billion of new export, energy, new export revenue from energy intensive low emissions products by 2040. And the national hydrogen strategy that we've got envisages hydrogen being an $11 billion industry in Australia by 2050. The investor group on climate change, an important group expects that an orderly transition to net zero by 2050 would unlock around $63 billion in new investment in Australia to 2025 and significantly more in the period out to 2050. So this energy transformation underway has immense potential for Australia. And many of these new jobs and new industries will be in the regions. They're not gonna be in our capital cities. And some of these opportunities are the focus of our technology investment roadmap, which Grant has worked on and been involved in a government supported research and development strategy to support the development and commercialization of new and emerging technologies that will reduce emissions and which are ones where Australia can play a leading role. And this is where bodies like the UNSW Energy Institute are doing such important work, one of the leads, world's leading research and technology hubs for energy innovation. Uh, some of the research and development you're pioneering there, whether it's around grids or hydrogen as a liquid fuel or any number of other things will be incredibly important to this future. Now, with our submarines, we dramatically updated a decision we made in 2016 to reflect our new national circumstances of 2021. And when it comes to our climate and energy policies, the positions we adopted in 2015 no longer reflect our national circumstances of 2021. And just as we did with our submarines, we need the same sort of recalibration to reflect our new set of national interests. What does this look like? Well. To me, and to be credible, we need a firm target and an accompanying plan to reach net zero emissions by 2050. We need sufficiently ambitious milestones and interim targets along the way to reach net zero by 2050. And I think here there's a strong case to be made to update our 2030 target, particularly as we're likely to overachieve it. Beyond that, though, um, our next nationally determined contribution, as it's called, a post-2030 target, needs to be significantly higher in ambition. And to my mind, a 2030 target of somewhere between 40 to 45% below our 2005 levels is achievable on the technology available today and with the policy levers available today. And that will put us on a managed transition pathway to net zero by 2050. And finally, we need a set of policies that position Australia to benefit from the massive global energy transformation underway in a way that Australia is uniquely positioned to do. These sort of policies will build on our national hydrogen strategy, our future fuels fund, a recapitalised and refocused Australian Renewable Energy Agency, and some of the other areas identified as priorities in our first low emissions technology statement. Now, 
to conclude and wrap up, Justine, just as what we used to call that information revolution has transformed the global economy of the early 21st century, so too, in my mind, the energy revolution now underway is likely to be equally profound in its implications. On the whole, this is good news for Australia. Yes, there will be some structural adjustments in Australia, just as there will be all around the world. But the upside opportunities for Australia are simply immense. We've got the potential to attract global capital, which is hungry, desperately hungry, for opportunities to invest in decarbonisation. We've got the potential to create new and diversified markets for a growing stream of Australian exports. We've got the potential to create the next generation of high-skilled and wealth-generating jobs, including in our regions. So to borrow a phase, uh, phrase rather from a predecessor of mine, this global energy transformation means it's never there's never been a more exciting time to be an Australian. Thank you, and thank you for having me here today, JJ. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, I, there was a little couple of snippets in the press this morning about what you were going to say, so it's fascinating to hear you elaborate on that. And um, for me, I guess it was um, urgent yet positive and hopeful yet purposeful. So um, with that, I'm going to um, go straight to some of the uh, audience questions that we've had just to make sure that we give everyone a chance to um, ask you about, um, sort of delve into this. And when I had a look at some of the questions that were submitted by the audience ahead of the event, I noticed that they were kind of largely grouped into things that could be either policy questions, technology questions, or questions about personal action. And so I'm going to start with some policy questions. And um, I guess the first one I've got relates to um, your comments about the IPCC report and urgency. Um, and I mean, it's interesting, On just on Friday, we saw that the UN published a report that said that the countries that had submitted new or revised national targets, their greenhouse gas emissions are forecast to fall 12% um, by 2030, um, and they're bending the curve now. But when that report last week looked at all the countries' um, current global national government pledges, they found that we're still going to lead to an increase of 16% in, in emissions um, by 2030 compared to the 45% fall that we'll need. Um, so um, the question that had come from the audience was, you know, how do you suggest that the coalition colleagues can be persuaded to attach the same urgency to address the problem in a meaningful way that, that you're hoping for? What will the actual process be of, of trying to get everybody to come in behind this? Yeah, look, I, I don't underestimate the sort of political difficulties of this issue in Australia, and that's almost, that's sort of a non-partisan comment. I mean, Australia's been uniquely bedeviled, I think, by uh, fractious politics um, over this issue. And I think it's incredibly important that for us to have a sustainable and enduring policy that we make sure that we, um, we take as much of the country with us uh, on this journey and we can't disregard some of their concerns. So, look, I, I fully respect and understand that um, my parliamentary colleagues, some of them sit within the coalition, some of them are in, in Labor as well, um, you know, are perhaps less enthusiastic about this transformation than I am, or they're more concerned about some of the, um, some of the impacts or the downsides of it. And I don't think we should, we can't, we can't and we shouldn't sugarcoat that. We can't and, and shouldn't pretend that there aren't gonna be adjustments here. What I think though has, has changed fundamentally well there's two things i think firstly um particularly in electrification and the cost of renewable energy the costs have come down so much now that you know renewable energy uh, even firmed is more cost competitive cheaper than new fossil fuel generation right so there's no longer kind of a, a price premium to doing this at least in electricity generation that will be true for transport and stationary energy and things like that so there's no longer it's we're no longer going to be putting ourselves at a disadvantage by doing this but the second thing i think is is the opportunities that are only now becoming available and visible and apparent in the transition to a net zero world and i touched on some of those um these are all big opportunities for the region i mean you know carbon sequestration or soil carbon for farmers. I mentioned the farm in New England that's already generated half a million dollars worth in carbon credits, not by closing off their land, not by ceasing to farm, but actually by improving the drought resilience and productivity of the land. And the main challenge there with soil carbon is, is finding an affordable way to measure it. Um, we've got technologies like that, but we've also got um, immense potential for Australia to be 
you know, producing green hydrogen as, a, as the liquid fuel of the future. Again, because of our endowment with solar and wind, we're uniquely positioned to do that. And although you know, we've now, as a government, allocated money to create seven hydrogen hubs all around Australia, those, those are still subject to tender and a competitive process. But if you look at the sort of places they're looking to put those and which places are bidding, they're all former heavy industry sites. You know, it's the Hunter Valley, it's Wyala. It's all places like that because it makes sense because they've got the land, they've got access to the infrastructure that you need um, to turn hydrogen into liquid fuel and they're close to a port. Um, all these things, I think, means that there's actually a lot of advantages for us in Australia. So I think it's important that we start to, and we're doing this, start to sort of map those out a bit more, not in an ephemeral way, in quite a concrete way. Um, and, you know, once people see, like in any transformation, these things, once they start to create jobs and wealth and people get employed in them, um, you know, people's political concerns can be alleviated much quicker than if you're sort of just showing them something on a whiteboard or say, oh, there's all going to be all these rivers of gold in the future. They want to see it happening now. So that's why pilot projects are important. That's why, you know, demonstrations of success are important because, you know, I, I do want to make sure that this isn't a city versus country thing. This isn't a, you know, New South Wales, Victoria versus WA and Queensland thing. The whole country needs to be with us on this journey if we're going to be, one, successful, but two, make sure that our policies are sustainable. Thank you. Um, I think we've probably have got some more questions on that coming through, which I'll have a look. But in the meantime, um, Grant, I might just pick up on Dave's comment about soil carbon. And there was a question that um, uh, someone submitted beforehand. Um, I know you, know you chaired the Australian government's expert panel on low cost, cost carbon abatement opportunities. The question is, how can Australia become a world leader in establishing standards and practices um, for soil carbon sequestration? Thanks, Justine. And if I could, just before responding to that question, just say a couple of words of thanks. Thanks first to yourself and uh, the university for hosting the session today and giving me an opportunity to participate. And particularly thanks to Dave for choosing to work with us in making what I think is um, a very timely, a very important speech. And a speech which is um, you know, put out there the idea of greater ambition and that will generate uh, a lot of discussion. But unless people are willing to put those ideas out there, um, we won't make the progress we need to make. So thank you very much, Dave, for your presentation today. It's great to hear you speaking in the way that you did. You've now dived into a particularly detailed question about soil carbon, and if I could make a general point before dealing with it more specifically. The, the word net in net zero is very important. And if you look in detail at the IPCC forecasts, uh, everything doesn't go to zero. Um, there is some idea of some optimum reduction in carbon emissions for which the balancing item is some form of sequestration or negative sinks in the language of IPCC. And so the world does need, again, in the words of IPCC, uh, negative sinks or sequestration on a massive scale. Now, it just so happens that one of the many competitive advantages we have in Australia is a landscape, in a sense, vastly disproportional to our population. And it's very important that we understand the potential of that landscape to sequester because it is also possible that Australia has not only industrial and manufacturing opportunities in the areas that Dave mentioned, but also in the, in the area of, let's call it over sequestration. That is the ability to sequester greater than the emissions that we might be left with on a net basis. Now, one of the key upside areas of that is soil carbon, because as yet there is no, or certainly to the extent that I'm aware of, there is no, sorry, I, I know there's about 600 acres that have been credited to soil carbon, which is a very, very small amount. And a, and a large number of soil carbon projects have now been submitted to the regulator. But in a sense, it is not yet contributing to the sequestration total. The ERF, from my memory, has currently acquired about 100 million tonnes of sequestration. And in that context, what's coming from soil carbon is very low. And as Dave Sharms mentioned, one of the critical issues is uh, a combination of knowing what the true potential is and being able to measure that uh, outcome to the necessary levels of verification that preserve integrity in these processes. Without integrity and verification, these systems won't be trusted uh, in the community to provide the sorts of offsets or negative sinks or sequestration that we needed. So measurement is critical. Uh, the news on this front is good. Uh, certainly last year, when we first began to talk about this in the technology roadmap, it was considered to be many, many years away before we could hit the goal of, of a couple of dollars a tonne a hectare. Uh, that goal is probably achievable within the next few years. Um, I've seen uh, research at other universities, for example, uh, which is suggesting that um, satellite sensing and measurement of soil carbon uh, is achievable in, in the very near future at very low cost. 
So the rate at which projects are being identified and submitted for registration with the Clean Energy Regulator is growing almost exponentially and, in fact, forms one of the largest parts of uh, new projects submitted uh, for the generation of ACUs. The scientific work is rapid and the farming community is getting right behind it. Having recently had consultations with the National Farmers Federation, the Meat and Livestock Association, they are extremely aware and attuned to the opportunity that soil carbon offers to provide an important part of the economic mix for farmers. Thank you. Um, I'm going to um, go to a question, another policy question. Um, and this one uh, was addressed for you, Dave, and it says, with the OECD led by Australian Matthias Cormann recommending a carbon tax for Australia, how likely is it that the Australian government will implement one? And, um, and then give a different playing field to, um, to renewables. Look, I, I appreciate the theoretical arguments in favour of a, you know, a broad market-based pricing mechanism um, because from an economist's perspective, it is you know, the, the most e efficient way to drive the right allocation of resources to meet a sort of overall policy objective. So I you know, appreciate those that make the arguments for it, but I'm also... You know, if nothing else, I'm a deep realist. And I think, um, you know, that ship has sailed in Australia. Uh, and indeed, around the world, we don't see a lot of, um, you know, efforts to, we don't see a lot of countries putting in carbon taxes. And people have different sort of mechanisms. I mean, we've got the, you know, Emissions Reduction Fund, which effectively is a, you know, allows the purchasing of um, credits. We've got things like the um, um, the safeguard mechanism, which operates a little like a cap and trade system over heavy industry. Um, and I think it's more than likely that we'll continue with, you know, a whole series of varied approaches. Some on the supply side, like investments in arena um, and the future fuels fund and things like that to drive that. Um, some on the, on um, you know, on the R&D side and whatnot. Um, but I just can't see, I can't see in Australia the sort of, it would be a pretty bold um, politician from any side now that would propose this. And I think the politics of it have become too fractured in Australia to, to want to see that happen. Um, you've also got the problem, of course, um, and the, this is one of the challenges in dealing with this issue. It's a very much a global commons challenge, right? Um, and so um, no country is going to want to do something that ends up um, unduly disadvantaging their own industry and all that happens is that there's leakage out to other jurisdictions which don't impose the same measurement so you know if, if you're a theoretician you'd say well there has to be a global carbon tax at the same level levied across all countries well you know good luck getting 194 countries to agree to that happening so um maybe we'll have a place you know in, in another country in a policy mix sometime in the future but i just don't see it happening in australia anytime soon okay. thank you Grant, you talk to a lot of companies in your former BCA role and now more recently with your Climate Change Authority hat on. Is there consensus in corporate Australia, do you think, about what government might do ahead of COP26 at a policy level? Um, well, I think, I think the most um, observable response that you've seen from corporate Australia is a num number of companies that have made net zero commitments by 2050. And... Uh, in some work we've done recently in the CCA where we've looked at global trends in trade and investment, that is not just a phenomenon in Australia, it's a global phenomenon. And what we're seeing is, is business uh, in all of its forms from finance at one end to you know, mining at the other and all things in between. Uh, companies all over the world and institutions that support those businesses all over the world are moving towards net zero commitments by 2050. Now, you could take a view and say, well, so what, 2050 is a long time away. But the important thing is that you're seeing that uh, result in action today mm. and the most common way that action manifests in Australia is, is in two respects. It's, it's the number of companies that are seeking to buy renewable energy and become counterparties uh, to underwrite the investment in wind and solar facilities, for example, and to less extent battery facilities in order to reduce the carbon intensity, the scope one and scope two emissions of what they do. Uh, and the second thing you're seeing companies do is participate in voluntary markets for sequestration uh, or that's effectively the ERF. And that's a very important point because uh, what that's doing is growing voluntary demand. And we, we're in a situation now where the government has funded the ERF to a very, very significant extent, you know, billions of dollars. But at the end of the day, the government's actually not having to spend as much money as it might have thought because voluntary markets are stepping in 
buying those credits. The price of credits has gone up from about $12 two or three years ago to around $25 plus today by that voluntary demand. And that voluntary demand for offsets together with the contracting for what we call running plant renewables is the practical outcome today from an increasing number of corporates in Australia, but also in terms of trend all over the world, uh, making these commitments to move towards net zero by 2050. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is about nuclear power. I think you could take it as a technology or economics question, but I think it was applied as a, uh, implied as a policy question and whether there are any plans regarding nuclear power in Australia. Um, look, so there, there are no plans. Uh, Australia is, um, as people would probably know, there's sort of a, a legislative bar against um, a civilian nuclear power industry in Australia is contained in the um, EPBC Act, the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. Um, I don't necessarily think it's it's that's the right approach to be taking. Um, you know, Australia is one of only I think three G20 countries that doesn't have civilian nuclear power. In some senses, we're obviously incredibly well endowed with uranium. I think the second largest or largest reserves in the world. Um, and, you know, those, those countries that have actually made quite a high transition to renewables in the grid have relied very much for nuclear for their base load. So if you look at, you know, much of Europe, France, the United Kingdom, the United States, Canada, they've all got nuclear um, in their mix. Now, in Australia, coal fulfills that role. Um, nuclear is obviously a whole lot cleaner than coal. And we will reach a point, um, if we're just talking about electricity generation here, where you know, the more renewables we put into the grid, um, the bigger the challenge is to, to firm them up, so to speak, and, and address the, the, the intermittency. And you can do that with, you know, big pump hydro projects like Snowy 2.0. Um, batteries are still very expensive for large scale, long duration um, storage. Um, so you, you do have a question mark about, well, you know, what is going to sort of be your 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 stabiliser within within the grid. Um, so, you know, I'd, I, I would just like to see in Australia that we we don't leave that option unexamined, which is effectively what that legislative bar does now. Now, um, people have obviously linked this to the decision with the submarines. They're, they're not related. I mean, you know, and the nuclear... Um, the, the, the nuclear power plant in a, in a submarine of whatever kind we get is sort of roughly the height, roughly the size of our Opal Research Reactor, the one nuclear reactor we have in Australia at Lucas Heights. Um, and the way they're done is that once they're basically installed, they don't come out again and they're not serviced again for 30 years. So it's not like we're going to be, this is going to be, we'll need to have people able to manage these, um, the propulsion plant on these submarines. But it's not necessarily the doorway to a nuclear industry in Australia. But I do think that is a debate that's worth having because I think obviously nuclear is, zero emissions it does have other complications um it might be that on the scale that we want to use it in australia it's never going to be commercial so be it but at the moment we can't even examine that option and i think that's something that we should be doing thank you grant i might pick up on that um, comment about not leaving this unexamined um to what extent um was nuclear envisaged in the technology roadmap um, it, it's, it's in there as a watching brief. Um, so if I could just make a couple of points, particularly to reinforce the point that Dave's made. I mean, this is the only area I know of where there's actually a prohibition uh, on an activity, uh, particularly in the energy sector. But the key point to take out of that is we won't accidentally have a nuclear industry. It is fundamentally and singly a matter for government. And so I don't think the community needs to be concerned that it will sneak up on us. Um, it is the only area, as I say, where there's an express prohibition. That's the first point. The second point is that I think the... That there is quite a thoughtful element of the environmental community that understands that nuclear has a role to play globally. And if we look back in time, you know, there was a period of time when we thought the traditional idea of base load nuclear reactors had their day. Uh, I can tell you that in the US and UK, public policy is very clearly focused on extending the life of those assets because, of course, they are zero carbon uh, generation in the system. And in fact, if we go to Germany, where they're still uh, retiring. Uh, those plants, um, notwithstanding the huge investment in renewables, uh, Germany's overall emissions have hardly reduced simply because the nuclear is coming out at about the same rate as renewables are going in from an, an emissions perspective. Mm. So the role of nuclear in those societies that have already made that decision is clear and is being, if anything, reinforced and will be extended. 
The third comment is a technology one, and that is that technology, as it does in everything, is moving increasingly quickly in this space and often in response to a seen opportunity. And the emergence of SMR technology, that is small modular reactor technology, and whilst it's not the same as what is in a nuclear powered vessel, it is of a size not dissimilar to what is in a nuclear powered vessel. And it has similar economic attributes as well, and that it's fueled for 30 years, its marginal cost is zero. It actually behaves and dispatches very much like renewables in a power grid. And that technology is progressing quite rapidly in the US and Canada uh, and in Russia, but certainly in the US and Canada, which has regulatory environments conducive to and amenable to and encouraging of investment in that form of technology. And my very strong belief is that as that technology becomes industrialized, Australia would be doing itself a grave disservice if it did not uh, provide for an industry that allowed it to acquire that technology in the same way as we've bought gas turbines in the past and coal boilers and anything else that we've um, built uh, renewables, you know, the majority of our solar panels, if not all of our solar panels, and our wind turbines come from overseas. So why we would exclude ourselves from markets, which will provide this technology at competitive costs is something I think is worth questioning in the long term. But I do reinforce this is one area where absent government, uh, a change in government policy, this industry will not sneak up on us. Thank you. So I'm gonna um, continue on the technology thematic here. We've got questions from the audience. And um, one of the questioners, Dave Sharma, was agreeing with you that renewables and batteries are cheaper and efficient and, and cleaner. Um, so the question is why are we still planning a gas-fired recovery? I think look, that, that term has been, I think, um, misunderstood in, in many respects. I mean, a large part of that sort of set of policy announcements was about basically addressing um, potential shortages and bottlenecks in supply of gas. And look, gas is used, um, yes, it's used for um, electricity generation, but generally speaking, um, and increasingly so, in a peaking or stabilising role um, and an intermittent role to balance out renewables in the grid. But gas is also a big feedstock for manufacturing in Australia. Households still uh, use gas and, and everything else. So, um, you know, I think, uh, and if you look at this, I mean, the... the this is still contentious within the community, I know, but if you look at um, facilities like the Curry Curry, the gas peaking plant up there, until we get to the point where large scale battery storage or something else can fill that void, what gas peaking plants allow us to do is basically put more renewables in the grid than would otherwise be the case because they provide the firming um, capacity for that to happen. So I know the purest position is no fossil fuels anymore ever anywhere um, but the commercial and the technological realities are that you need um, these things fossil fuels will undoubtedly become less important as part of our energy mix over time but at the transition phase that we're in now and particularly until either hydrogen or large-scale battery storage or something else becomes um, commercially affordable and competitive what this does is allow us to bring more renewable energy into the grid um, and put more facilities than would otherwise be the case. I know that's a, you know, that the subtlety of that is sometimes lost in the public debate, but it's an important one to be mindful of that, you know, you, you can't, you can't be too doctrinaire about this and say um, all fossil fuels are bad. I think gas peaking will have a role to play in our energy transition, but I'd love to hear Grant's views on this as well, because he's more technologically minded than I am. Uh, well, I'll take that as an invitation. <laughs> um, and could I answer that with an advertisement to start with? Um, and that is that when you work with uh, University of New South Wales, you realise that the world of technology is boundless in terms of what can be done, um, both in terms of new technologies and driving down the cost of existing technologies. And so I approach all of these questions from a completely technology agnostic, field agnostic point of view. That's the first point. The second point is if you look deeply into the IPCC work and the IEA, the Institute of Energy, uh, that kind of pairs with it. Uh, we're still contemplating a world which is net zero in 2050, but still uses fossil fuels at the rate of about 20% of which it uses it today. So fossil fuels will be part of our mix, but they will either be abated, so that is in some form of probably geosequestration, or they will be used as chemicals, chemical building blocks. And again, if I think about the work at the University of New South Wales, not only are we have leading researchers, you know, globally leading researchers in solar. Uh, we have probably arguably Australia's only capable nuclear energy faculty as well. But we also have in terms of um, what people call direct air capture, you know, great capabilities in that area as well. So by 2050, we're envisaging a world. And in fact, if you look deeply into the IPCC report, you'll see beyond 2050, 
it is all about negative sequestration, negative emissions. We're talking about using CO2 as building blocks for making many of the chemicals and uh, other things that we use today. Now, natural gas is also one of those building blocks. So being a technology and fuel agnostic person, it will continue to play a role. And particularly, and I'm taking probably a 10 or 15 or 20 year view, we do not have a solution for deep storage. We will not get, that's in our electricity systems, we will not get the level of renewable energy penetration by withdrawing coal and just using the battery technology that we have today or are likely to have in the next five or 10 years. We do need gas, particularly as a lowest source or lowest, sort of lowest emissions intensity source of burning fuel, not to bridge four hours or eight hours or 12, but to bridge two weeks, because that's what happens in the system. Um, you know, we often have, or will have without coal, 10 days, 20 days uh, of very low generation from renewable resources. So it has a role to play for many, many reasons. Thank you. Um, there's a deeper technology question, Grant, so I might stick with you for a minute, and that is mm -hmm. highlighting the trade-offs and opportunities between demand response and load shifting um, versus fixed energy storage and other energy storage, for example, um, you know, vehicle to grid um, and thermal storage. And so just the way that you might see that playing out in Australia's energy future. Mm. Yeah, so it used to be that that demand management was a way of levelizing out your generation um, so we could better match the profile to our baseload coal fired power stations. Um, and that was you know, the early days. That's why we had off peak hot water, for example, and other things, um, uh, as I say, to improve the utilization of particularly coal fired power stations. Now, the power stations, the future are going to be largely renewables. Uh, and of course, they're intermittent. So you've got a completely different generational supply profile than we've had historically. And the question is how much you balance that system out. And one part which both Dave and I have talked to is you do need a firming fuel that's reliable and independent system that's firming. So that will be the role of natural gas you know, for quite some time. But what we're of course contemplating is a world where you've got three major potential new sources of demand for electricity and they are potentially interruptible as well. And they're in no particular order of importance the generation of hydrogen um, you know, from the grid, 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 grid energy. Uh, the other is uh, the charging of batteries for storage uh, for when we see those periods of intermittency. And the third is for electric vehicles. And so much has been said about the potential to use those to uh, shift demand and manage demand and fit demand better to a very different supply profile from the old days when we had baseload energy to the new days when we've got quite intermittent energy. And certainly that forms the potential to do, to do those things. And of course, what we envisage as the grid of the future is a highly, a very smart, highly digitalized grid that is trying to balance out the, the various sorts of demand, the various sources of supply to produce the best overall and lowest overall price of energy. Now, of course, the final point to make is that what that does is ultimately mean the market will clear on price and the algorithms and intelligence in the system that does that will need to solve for something and it will solve for price. So I think what we'll see in the very long run is quite a flat electricity price. And of course, that also goes back to economic outcomes because many of the business models today are in fact premised on a significant arbitrage between peak and off peak pricing. Mm -hmm. And I do wonder whether that will exist in a highly intelligent grid, which levelizes and solves for price. So it will be a different world, but there are many levers that can be pulled and much intelligence, uh, human and artificial, that can be applied to solving that problem. Thank you. So there are quite a few questions coming through about specific technologies or technology projects, um, uh, flow batteries for long duration, um, chemical storage, solar updraft towers and, and others. I think in the time that we've got left, what I'd like to do though is maybe broaden the quest those questions and group them up a bit and ask, um, how do we actually get um, new technologies to see a pathway through deployment and those important um, pilot projects and demonstrations that uh, Dave Sharma alluded to into where they're actually got a, a, you know, a specific market for them? And so what is the process in the technology roadmap to kind of see past that visioning? And do you think that we've got the right support from a policy and market perspective to allow um, those new technologies to rapidly accelerate um, through into the marketplace? So Dave and, and Grant. Just, yeah, sure, well, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off, but um, uh, and then I think Grant will have a lot to add. Look, I think um, there are a lot of, you know, new and exciting technologies out there now. And of course, some of them will succeed and some of them won't either for 
technical reasons or affordable affordability reasons or they're not scalable or deployable at large scale, all those sorts of things. So, you know, it's important that we have a, a portfolio approach to this. That is, we don't um, invest everything in in one technology either as, a, as an economy or a government. I think the things we've got going for us now, though, we've got, um, look, we've got the R&D capacity. We've got more and more people doing R&D work here around the world. I mean, UNSW Energy Institute is a, a great case in point, but there are other facilities like it, dare I say, in Australia, not as good, of course, but some in Australia um, and then around the world. So we've got the R&D happening. In Australia, we've got bodies, particularly like um, ARENA, which is helping to kind of, bridge that funding gap before any private capital would get involved. So this is to um, allow people to go off and, and pursue these options without having to worry about um, raising money or doing an angel funding round or, you know, a, a Series A or a Series B. Um, and I think that's important. We've seen the ecosystem in Australia grow, I think, in large part in response to this. And we just recapitalised um, ARENA uh, in, in the last financial year, given them certainty 10 years out. But we've also broadened out their mandate so they can look at um, things that we need to look at, you know, low emissions, uh, steel, soil sequestration, carbon soil and, and those sorts of things. The last thing I'd say, though, is that we've also got capital that's very hungry for these opportunities uh, now. Um, you know, we've got corporates, as, as Grant mentioned, that are increasingly wanting to make sure that they make play their part by committing to net zero, but we've also got like big funds under management industries, which see this as the next big opportunity. And they're very hungry for all the stuff that's uh, in the pipeline. You know, it's, it's the equivalent I touched upon, you know, the Facebooks and Googles and Amazons in the start of my speech. Well, you know, global capital is looking for the next generation of those companies that are going to be operating in the energy space. So they're looking for the technology that's a game changer. And, you know, I expect that a lot of the stuff that, will be a feature of our energy landscape in 20 to 30 years. We, it, it doesn't even exist now. It's in a very, you know, prototype in a lab stage only. We don't actually know what that looks like. But with capital chasing the opportunities, with the research and development being done and with government being supportive, I think we'll see a lot more of this stuff come forward in the, in the you know, months and years ahead. Grant, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, look, I think... I was given a wonderful articulation, particularly of the roadmap and what the government's going to achieve with that, although just a few sort of minor points, some um, probably three. Um, the, object, the roadmap process has many objectives, but, but a couple of the critical ones is firstly to really focus on what we call priority technologies. Those technologies that will make a really big difference over the next 20, 30 years in terms of both emissions and economic activity. So it is exactly what it says it is, and that's trying to give a very clear signal to the market about the big impact areas. Um, value tends to follow you the big impact, you know, follow those areas. The second is a really, really important point, and that is in setting a target for where technologies need to get to. That target is set at the equivalent uh, of today's best technology. And that's a really, really important point because for those that want to get involved in debates about, you know, to reduce emissions, we need subsidies and we'll never be able to get there. It's going to cost a lot more. No, that is not the philosophical core of the roadmap. What's at the philosophical core is that technologies, low emissions technologies, substitute existing technologies because they're cleaner, quicker, faster, cheaper, better for customers. They have a whole series of benefits. Those very things that have driven innovation universally and for all time. And if those things occur, uh, we will be able to make the transitions without it being a significant burden on our economy. So there are some very important sort of philosophical principles around which that roadmap is based priorities and parity, cost parity. Mm. Thank you. Um, we're just about out of time. I'm going to sneak in another question. Um, and there were quite a few questions where people asked what they could do themselves to get involved professionally or personally. Um, and I might just make a bit of a statement on this as well on behalf of UNSW. I mean, things that are very wicked problems like the climate emergency, I think we, we all need to collaborate. And we've deliberately brought together perspectives here from industry, from government, from um, from academia to try and help to collaborate to solve that. And, um, you know, at the university, we help organisations and people to see over the horizon to future-proof solutions, to de-risk major projects and investment decisions, um, to do technical tests on new products, um, and to leverage other money on, on top of um, investment and to access talent and skills. So um, I would like to have an open invitation to people if they want to get involved um, professionally to, to reach out and see how they can collaborate. But I will leave um, you with a question, Dave Sharma, someone's asked very specifically, how can they help 
uh, you to lobby the government to allocate more funding to this space? Well, thank you for the, the offer of support, and it's very much appreciated. I mean, look, I would say, um, well, firstly, if I'm your local MP, get in touch with me and tell me what you think. But also, if, if I'm not your local MP, get in touch with your whoever that is and let them know what you think. I, I would say um, it's important, I think, in, in this debate, there's a few things that I sometimes see that go wrong. One is the sort of the tendency to kind of demonise the other side, which is seen too often, and take a quite a dogmatic view of it, which which sort of alienates the very people you need to get on board with this um, transition. I think um, there's, you know, so so I guess in your public conversations and your interactions, uh, focus on convincing and persuading the other side, not hectoring or badgering them, you know, because there are people in Australia who, as around the world, are still sceptical about this, or if they're not sceptical, they, they are worried about what it means for them personally, and they need to be reassured and have their concerns addressed, not, not, um, not dismissed. Um, last thing I'd say is, I mean, also, you know, the federal government plays an important role here, undoubtedly, but so does state and local government. So, you know, look at things like, um, you know, is your local government area putting in charging infrastructure for electric vehicles? Um, are there, you know, building efficiency projects for, um, you know, apartment buildings? Is your local council offering um, food and organic composting for the waste services? Because that's a big contributor to methane in Australia is food and organic waste going to landfill. So also don't forget to the importance of kind of doing things at a micro as well as a macro level, because together they'll all get us somewhere. Thank you. And uh, while you're holding the floor, is there any final statement you'd like to make? I'll ask Grant for the same thing in a moment. Oh, well, thank you for, for <laughs> listening to me today. Um, I think, you know, um, keep, up, uh, keep up your enthusiasm and interest uh, in this area. Uh, it's right to be concerned and it's right to take this issue very seriously, but don't let that lead into despondency because ultimately, you know, the way we will address this is the way humans have addressed any number of other challenges we face is through uh, innovation, ingenuity and, and change behaviour. But, um, you know, too often I know people, when they deal with this issue, they kind of, they, they despair. There are very exciting things happening in this space that I'm confident will provide us a pathway out of here. Thank you. Grant? Oh, some very brief comments. Um, Justine, firstly, again, thanks very much to Dave for, again, what I think is both very timely, but also a very thoughtful contribution. And I think also, Dave, shows that there are people in government thinking deeply, but there's a lot to do when you're in government, from submarines to, <laughs> to COVID to, to energy. And it's great to see that, that deep within government, people are thinking you know, deeply and hard about these issues and taking the debate forward. So I think that's very, very encouraging. Thank you for your time. In the CCA, we're doing some work which we expect to release shortly. And we just fundamentally believe we need to change the conversation. It's not a transition, it is a transformation. And I think there is a difference between the words and Dave's right to focus on that word transformation. Uh, we think the conversation needs to change from seeing a response to climate change from an issue about cost to an issue about competitive advantage. And if we get that, then we will find it incredibly motivating because there is no lack of alternatives or options for us to make enormous progress very quickly on this issue. So thanks very much again for the opportunity. Dave, thanks very much again for uh, working with us in your time today. Well, thank you both. Look, um, this um, is going to be available to view tomorrow. So if people want to review um, or they missed any bits of it or want to link it to uh, uh, others, then do please feel free to, um, to view it from tomorrow. And there'll also be a link to an upcoming digital event, A Zero Carbon World on 13th of October. Thank you so much, uh, Dave Sharma and Grant King for joining us today. And thank you to everybody for the questions that you submitted. Have a lovely day. Thanks, Jojo. Thank you, Grant. Bye-bye.